good morning uh, we can uh, start the discussion uh, where we have uh, stopped last uh, week we were broadly going through the details of uh, the the program that uh, we will see in this uh, course for the the full semester this time and uh, we have actually uh, uh, got hold of uh, a lot of details last week in terms of how the uh, uh, how the present i mean the program would look like in terms of uh, the the details of subjects that we would cover and uh, and here uh, uh, i have also mentioned that we would touch upon financial crisis and and then of course uh, some elements in terms of uh, the the uncertainties uh, uh, arrive from uh, pandemics like what we are going through now i'll also try to incorporate that aspect into the equation when i am trying to discuss financial crisis uh, 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 in the coming uh, coming weeks and broadly uh, uh, when you say uh, uh, the the details uh, in terms of uh, monetary growth that is the quantum or the volume of money available in an economy i was highlighting in our last discussion uh, where the the money numbers would be represented through number of uh, 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 m's right so slower the m like m0 would reflect uh, most liquid components of uh, money supply available in an economy for instance if you say uh, m0 open it reflects uh, we call something called monetary base if not base money that is nothing but currency in circulation and the commercial banks deposits with the central bank that is reserves right so then you add on additional components of money supply like uh, time deposits that is normal saving deposits Uh, whatever the other type of elements you brought into the equation and you expand the m m2 m2 b m3 m4 you can go on like that so we will get into some of those elements and see the quantum of money available in economy and how this would affect the business cycles and you probably uh, uh, touched um, uh, uh, based on how i was explaining uh, last week in terms of how us economic cycles Uh, uh the growth cycle long term growth pattern of uh, us economy that was reflected in the business cycle for any country you can have a business cycle right generally you see the economy is growing but at different stages of um, this growth cycle you probably see in some years you find that the economy is growing fast in some years the economy is growing slow so likewise you can see these elements uh, Uh, uh broadly uh, in line with uh, the the economy's progression but then you try to link that with the money quantum of money available at different periods and compare whether there is a possibility that uh, money supply has contributed to some uh, to, to to some extent in terms of these movements and this chart that you are seeing on the screen now shows the shaded areas at different stages of us economy and this shaded area shows the negative growths that is a recessionary periods in us economy a recession in us is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth now sri lanka has seen uh, in 2020 uh, uh, the economy has grown negatively and now first quarter of 2021 yesterday the department of census and statistics released the growth numbers the economy has grown by 4.3% compared to 2020s first quarter year on year growth of 4.3% and all three sectors agriculture industry services contributed uh, for that growth and of course to some extent the lower base uh, Uh, a prevail previously also might be the cause but then of course you you will see uh, in 2020 second quarter the first covid hit uh, economy has gone down very sharply in sri lanka's case that means uh, a comparison this year 
the second quarter we had some difficulties yes limited uh, shutdowns and things like that movement restriction and things like that so still we probably see some growth in comparison to last years because last year's uh, second quarter was uh, very sharply declined in sri lanka's case so you are comparing this growth and what you are seeing here is the growth cycles in terms of uh, us and then of course uh, there's a shaded areas that's a recessionary period and then the money growth the growth i mean uh, it's not that money stock uh, is reflected here compared to last year whether the money stock has grown up by 10% 5% 2% or no growth is what you are seeing here right so we will try to study these things also when we uh, elaborate some of these uh, elements in our uh, uh, discussion and and this being said uh, i'm just uh, pausing for a minute uh, to see whether uh, any one of you have anything to clarify uh, uh, or whatever you have uh, uh, seen last week whatever you discussed with me last week um, any further questions that you have in terms of uh, uh, elements to be clarified here so we can uh, we can continue Uh, the discussion the presentation uh, if you have anything please feel free to raise it or put down uh, the message box so i can quickly follow it up uh, with an explanation right right so let's move on i mean uh, silence uh, means that you probably gather in your thoughts to come out and question yes uh, we'll take those uh, as we move on so then what you are simply seeing is a uh, 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 different stages of uh, economy in us and the money supply growth then there is a relationship in terms of uh, uh, what you are seeing here uh, uh, in terms of uh, us uh, economic cycles uh, where you see from this chart uh, the money supply growth and the aggregate price level aggregate price level is nothing but the inflation okay so when you see inflation how the inflation was behaving over a period of time so that is interesting and aggregate uh, 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 price level Uh, behaved across uh, different periods as per the uh, 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 the us economy is reflected here and what is interesting here is normally there's a uh, explanation in terms of uh, the monetary economics if not the monetary policy is being discussed uh, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon this was said by so called milton friedman what he was trying to say from that is when you have a higher money growth at one point or the other you will find price levels that means inflationary pressures building and inflation would be experienced in the economy so this is the explanation by uh, 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 milton friedman in line with uh, his uh, uh, experiences in the us economy and other uh, advanced economies uh, mainly during 60s and prior to that but what is interesting after uh, uh, 1980s 1990s is that the 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 monetary authorities worldwide uh, that means the central banks around the world has found ways to manage the inflationary pressures there are exemptions um, we don't get into that but uh, generally they were able to contain inflationary pressures by managing uh, 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 inflationary expectations right but what you are seeing here is the red line shows the money supply growth and uh, then of course you see the the price level or the inflation measured as a gdp deflator deflator is uh, you are just real gdp with the nominal gdp in any economy so that small reflection of uh, the price component in uh, uh, economy but what you are basically seeing here is 
when the money supply increases, the price level also increases to some extent. So that's been reflected in this. But that relationship was reasonably strong uh, until mid 1980s. Like since then, even though the money supply increases at a much faster pace, you don't see inflation is increasing like that. So that's why I said uh, uh, in recent times, uh, the central banks worldwide managed to find ways and means to uh, 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 manage inflationary expectation uh, in comparison to the previous periods where the countries had uh, different episodes of inflation and money supply. So this is also one element uh, you would see, but this is empirical evidence. U.S. economy, more information available. Through that information, you see this relationship. So we will uh, touch upon some of these aspects as we move on and try to elaborate and try to understand how central banks works in this uh, course, right? So these are insights that you will uh, already now uh, get into know. Uh, uh, we will get into uh, these and uh, elaborate a little more in terms of your understanding for the program itself. Then you see uh, uh, inflation rates uh, and monetary growth across different countries in the world, right? So you see, uh, 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 the inflationary growth um, and money supply across different parts of the world uh, is here. And uh, what you are basically seeing here is uh, 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 inflation and um, money growth rate. Okay, inflation is the speed in which prices grow and it's reflected as an index. Right, so we said it's a basket and you see comparison of uh, different periods uh, in the economy and they try to figure it out. And when you see this uh, relationship uh, uh, in uh, 2000s, uh, first 10 years of uh, the new millennium, so you see uh, 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 the, the money growth is higher, the inflationary possibility is also higher. The countries who had higher money growth numbers, they had uh, inflation pressures. But at the same time, countries whose inflation and money supply was maintained at a reasonably uh, a low level in line with the economy's requirements, probably you see uh, uh, less likelihood of uh, the inflationary pressures. But interestingly, here too, you are, if you draw a 45 degree line here, right, most of the country's experiences fall not towards the y-axis, but towards the x-axis. That simply say, uh, uh, in comparison to previous periods in history, the money supply growth and inflation relationship has weakened, right? But still it's a positive uh, trajectory. That's why people are discussing uh, uh, money supply and then try to kind of figure it out, uh, its influence on inflation or the price levels, right? So what you are basically seeing is even by drawing a 45 degree line here, most of the countries would be in this, this side. So that means even though the money supply is high, growth is high, but you probably not reflect you of that much of inflation. But uh, some cases it's not the case like countries here because they had very challenging, difficult times uh, during this 2000, 2010 period. But subsequently, they also managed to bring much more orderly uh, uh, inflationary conditions. Right. So then uh, we also keep a very close eye on uh, this aspect uh, in our discussion. Uh, this is money and interest rate. Okay. We have already mentioned interest rate and we try to define that. We said that. Uh, uh, sorry, you uh, sorry to disturb you. Yeah. Um, you uh, presenting any uh, presentation slides we cannot view those slides sir you cannot see the slides yes is that the case with everybody else i think because uh, minuti also commented on uh, that she can't uh, view the slides right 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 so i'm just wondering uh, give me a second i'll check with that uh, element uh, 
Do you see the slides now? Not yet, sir. I hope now you can uh, see the slides, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, so I was uh, actually taking you all through with some of these slides here. Uh, uh, this is available anyway with you all in terms of handouts. But I was explaining uh, from the perspective where uh, uh, you see uh, uh, the relationship in terms of inflation and money supply growth. I said that the initial period, the relationship was strong, but then in recent years, the relationship has weakened. And, and this again reflective in the uh, 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 next slide, the relationship here also, you see uh, money growth and inflation uh, uh, in countries uh, in 2000s. So the first 10 years of 2000s, and you see, if you draw a 45 degree line here, most of the countries would fall into the uh, x-axis x side, not to the y-axis sides. And, and that to some extent reflect uh, the, the money supply growth and the relationship with the inflation has weakened, but still some countries have high inflationary numbers due to various reasons during this period, but subsequently they managed. The countries who are managing uh, uh, very moderate money supply growth and then of course they managed to have uh, a reasonably low inflation but subsequent to the financial crisis most countries have experienced very low if not closer to zero inflation levels with uh, economic downturns and things like that in 2008-9 financial crisis and in the subsequent years and similar experiences now uh, uh, reflective in uh, most of the uh, countries driven by the COVID pandemic and things like that. Uh, uh, you will uh, see uh, some of this relationship as we discuss uh, in most of our discussions uh, in, in, in coming lectures, coming weeks. And then I was explaining uh, about the money and the interest rates. Uh, the money and the interest rates uh, we touched upon in uh, trying to define what is interest rates and try to understand the uh, intricities, but very interestingly, the interest rate area of this program is very, very important. Please take note of that aspect because that would uh, 
cover not only i mean most of the thinking that you have in terms of how economies behave in terms of the policy decisions by central banks so interest rate is one of the most uh, sought after policy tools interest uh, instruments that the central banks have all around the world so from another perspective interest rates are the price of money like uh, 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 any other price that you pay uh, uh, for any goods or services so interest rate is the price of the money so if you hold that money in your wallets that money would not work for you so you would not earn anything but if you put that money to work either in terms of uh, investing in financial intermediaries or investing in terms of uh, any other financial assets that would bring you some returns so you can immediately see it's as the price that you are uh, foregoing by holding onto your wallets or making use of uh, the the money that's available with you to work for you even you are studying now by spending money is indirectly an investment that is expected to uh, give you much more higher uh, prospects of uh, earnings in the future right so effectively what you are basically seeing here is uh, interest rates as a price of money so we will get into greater details and 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 then as i said prior to 80s the rate of money growth and the interest rate on long term treasury bonds were to some extent this is again reflective the inflation and money growth relationship right so the long term uh, financial assets like treasury bonds their interest rates are linked with inflation inflation expectations okay so to great extent prior to 80s there was a very close uh, relationship in terms of uh, money growth inflation and then of course uh, long term interest rates of financial assets like treasury bonds but subsequently you have seen money growth and inflation the relationship also weaken there are reasons for that we will uh, get into those details um, uh, as we study on and and the relationship with money growth and long term treasury bond yield rates also to some extent weaken there are other elements coming to play and that drive the interest rate structures of these financial instruments okay uh, uh, that's to say that this relationship between uh, long term uh, interest rates of financial assets and money growth become less clear cut but the rate of money growth is still an important determinant of interest rates there is no argument that remains one of the most important determinants of interest rates because if you expect money growth to be higher interest rates um, somehow reflective of uh, this development but then of course the level effect the height that i was explaining in our last class has now uh, uh, to great extent uh, factored in to the levels that we are seeing in interest rates and therefore you might not necessarily see it's very closely tied but uh, some reflection is there so this is also one area that uh, we would uh, spend uh, a reasonable time in understanding in our discussions and then you see again uh, uh, as we were looking at inflation and money growth you see again interest rates and money growth relationship here right so the blue line is money growth red line is the interest rate so you can see even in us the interest rates were around 15 16% uh, on average uh, of uh, us treasury bonds uh, during mid 80s where the inflation also high during this period in us uh, uh, after the oil price shock you can go to the google and try to see what was the inflation um, in us in 80s what's the reason for inflation in 80s right so that's a concept uh, you will come to come across as oil price shock because oil prices uh, actually shut up during this period due to uh, a cartel behavior of oil producing uh, uh, nations this is the period where the opec came into equation and um, they started uh, controlling some supply to the world market through which the prices have increased and then the prices of all goods and services across the world increased during this period 
So subsequently, there were a lot of measures by the, the countries to minimize the influence of such possibilities. But still, you see the interest rates were high. And money growth rate, growth rate is not the level, okay, from what it was last year, by how much it has grown, whether it is 10% or whether it is 2% or negative. For instance, in 2004, like you see, it's negative. Money growth is negative in US. There are reasons for that. And then, of course, uh, all of a sudden, interest rates started uh, uh, increasing. What you are basically seeing is uh, when the, the, the money growth declines, the interest rate increases. When money growth increases, interest rates decline. So that's the general relationship that you will come across uh, uh, because the money growth is additional money available for the economy through which you see you are injecting liquidity to the market. Okay, so when you inject liquidity, right, more liquidity is available for uh, uh, activities in the economy. As a result, more liquidity will drive interest rates to come down. So that's a general relationship having taken out so-called Cetris Peribus factors. So taken in, taken in Cetris Peribus factors, other things constant. Yes. Yes. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, that's two thirty, isn't it? The, I'm right now at a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right, right. Yes, yes, I'll be brief there. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Right. So you are seeing uh, the, the relationship in terms of uh, 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 what we were uh, trying to get at in terms of uh, uh, some of the elements uh, that we discussed all throughout. And then uh, we are also trying to take into account the fiscal policy aspects uh, uh, that uh, influences the monetary policy. And, and this is a very interesting area because in today's uh, economies, there is a significant um, element being discussed uh, in terms of uh, 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 fiscal policy dominance in monetary policy activities, particularly in uh, frontier and developing economies. And in Sri Lanka's case also, there is a significant uh, discussion where uh, uh, monetary authorities, central banks are uh, uh, basically accommodating uh, uh, money printing uh, exercises in terms of uh, meeting governments of deficit financing. So that's a kind of a challenge, but what is fiscal, fiscal policy in terms of uh, 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 the, 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 the discussion is that the government spending measures and the taxation measures, that's the fiscal policies. Uh, um, and the money, monetary policies often deals with the uh, money supply, management of money supply and the interest rates um, uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, managing economic uh, activities and also managing expectations. So we would look into this um, element also in our discussions. Uh, what is interesting here is when you say a fiscal policy where the spending and in, uh, a taxation policy is being looked at, and you know deficits, budget deficits, budget surpluses, okay, and deficit is always the expenditure is greater than revenue. I don't want to explain these things, but uh, just a kind of a, a very minute uh, a touch uh, in terms of what is the deficit. These are the surpluses you are revenues are in excess of your expenditure. But most of the country is experiencing deficits. So the deficits has to be financed. That has to be financed. 
that uh, financing aspect um, uh, would work um, in terms of uh, uh, either through uh, borrowing from financial markets, borrowing from financial markets, or for that matter, the financing through the uh, uh, creation of uh, money or other elements. So we see these uh, factors uh, in our discussion uh, all throughout. Yeah. Right. So, any question before I move on to clarify further details? I see some disturbances here and there, maybe due to the bad weather and uh, maybe the windy conditions. Uh, Still, to some extent, prevail, uh, uh, but not to the extent of what you have experienced last night. Right. So you see the the fiscal policy and the monetary policy relationship, and and here you see the U.S. Uh, the deficit. Uh, 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 over the period uh, where you the see the majority of the time they had deficits and then uh, they, they have financed through uh, uh, various arrangements uh, to make that uh, the, the budgets being brought into much more manageable levels. Right. So then we also touched upon uh, so-called uh, foreign exchange market. The foreign exchange market, uh, we would uh, very brief uh, because I'm uh, aware by the time that we come to this topic uh, from my previous experiences, uh, we might not have much time to uh, elaborate. Uh, we come to the tail end of our program by this time. So the foreign exchange market is uh, very much timely in today's context uh, where people also talk about uh, uh, a gray, if not parallel markets in terms of uh, exchange rate uh, limitations that the country is uh, facing at the moment. But interestingly, the foreign exchange market is where the money, one currency is traded to, if not converted to another. So it's like um, uh, you basically exchanging currencies and you know to some extent from your other classes and other engagements. Uh, and, and like interest rate, foreign exchange rate is the price of one currency in terms of another currency. You express uh, 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 one US dollar in terms of uh, how many Sri Lankan rupee units. So you express price of US dollar in terms of another currency. So it is the price that you are again discussing. So you can uh, now start uh, building a kind of a basic mindset uh, to define most of these uh, concepts that you come across in uh, macroeconomics and of course the financial markets and the monetary policy by bringing in the element of price, the concept of price. So interest rates, now exchange rate, okay? So the foreign exchange market, like financial market where the assets been, uh, asset price has been determined, uh, a foreign exchange market determines the foreign exchange rate. So this is uh, another area we would touched upon this area uh, uh, briefly. As I said, we would uh, come to a, a tail end of our discussions by this time. And then you see the, the behavior of US dollar uh, against uh, uh, index of currencies, uh, major currencies in terms of, this is not Sri Lankan rupees behavior, but this is US dollars behavior for a, uh, uh, let's say a 40 year period in US, uh, what you are basically seeing here is uh, the US dollar presented as an index where 1973, if you parcel all the major currencies and make the index as 100, 
okay so the exchange rate was still reasonably around that level had the uh, upswings downswings yes we can strengthen but generally us dollar remains around uh, uh, a fair value in terms of this index itself so if you look at the currencies of um, uh, uh, other frontier and emerging market economies you probably see the 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 currencies would have uh, more or less uh, weakened right so there are very uh, important reasons that you will come across in this aspect uh, we will try to reach uh, and try to discuss these things uh, but as i said uh, sometimes we might not be able to cover most of these elements uh, 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 during the uh, limited time durations that we have but we'll try at least to see some basic elements being discussed in this program then the international financial system this is very important in today's context uh, because the financial markets have become uh, increasingly integrated you know sri lanka cannot uh, work in isolation the globally we require to engage in terms of uh, financial movements inflows outflows not only the uh, 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 financial assets and uh, 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 financial resources but at the same time uh, uh, goods and services you see labor is very flexible they move around so the payments for labor right similarly the goods the trades and also the financial and other services tourism um, entertainment education all there even uh, telecommunication freight um, uh, uh, cargo shipping all there so it's a, it's a much more integrated aspects which becomes uh, uh, very important in today's context um, uh, to see the importance of financial markets uh, uh, play in these uh, economic activities okay so then the impact of this international financial system when i say international financial system uh, uh, there are multilateral global financial agencies they act as uh, uh, a global uh, in a way global central banks to some extent uh, but it's the uh, more or less uh, they are the 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 people uh, these multilateral agencies are the ones who ultimately Uh, assist in balance of payment difficulties balance of payment is your inflows and outflows uh, 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 in terms of foreign uh, assets flow in and flow out from your economies and if you have uh, difficulties um, uh, in terms of managing those you fall back on some of these agencies to have uh, some uh, temporary cushion being built and then of course uh, possible policy arrangements and uh, 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 uh policy measures been introduced okay so ultimately i mean to facilitate this engagement across uh, globally integrated financial markets uh, uh countries choice of exchange rate policy is also very important because that ultimately affect the monetary policy so what type of exchange rate policy that you wanted to have and similarly whether you allow the capital to flow in flow out to your domestic economies okay so everything else being equal set vis paribus if your interest rates are higher than the other neighboring or global interest rates then the foreign capital should come in to your economy because you expect higher return uh, of course then the exchange rate would come and wipe out part of this uh, return that you have in uh, interest rate because if you see in your economy the interest rate is now what one year interest rate is about 5.2% treasury bill one year interest rate in sri lanka right us one year interest rate is only only 0.2 if not 0.15 15 to 20 basis points so see the difference so that that means the foreigners can come in and invest here but unfortunately other elements play so when your exchange rate is depreciating by 5 or 6% right so effectively you are carrying a negative return because you invest in sri lanka and get 5 and 1/2% for investing for one year when you want to take back uh, the same dollar back to 
U as. So now what you gain as 5% is uh, not enough to cover this, to buy the same dollar when you are going back to your economy because the depreciation has wiped out. So these are matters of importance in terms of managing exchange rates and also the, the entire financial system. So then we also look at the, the role of international financial institutions, particularly that of International Monetary Fund, IMF. There are a lot of arguments um, you know, why IMF should not be, why IMF should be. Uh, that is very interesting because people sometimes think uh, IMF comes and um, disregard your domestic priorities and in, in force on discipline on your economic activities. So it's good to bring in economic activities some discipline. Uh, otherwise, uh, 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 the, the fiscal dominance over other policies would drive our economic activities to uh, continuously deteriorate without um, having uh, adequate measures to bring in fiscal discipline. So there are various arguments for and against in this uh, exercise. We will try to see because this international financial system is very important in today's context. Right. So what you will see in all throughout uh, our discussions uh, uh, for this program, uh, we would uh, basically bring in a simplified approach to demand for assets. So it is, uh, you have already seen demand curves, supply curves. Uh, we would see demand for financial assets as a driver in defining uh, uh, prices and uh, the, the assets uh, behavior in our discussions. So you know the concept of equilibrium. You have already studied. So it is basically the point where supply and demand meets, right? So the concept of equilibrium is again uh, 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 elaborated to figure it out. Bond supply, bond demand, where the bond interest rate, similarly other financial assets, okay? So we are basically looking at basic supply and demand to explain behavior in financial markets. How the investors behave when the interest rate increase, uh, how the, uh, uh, the, the parties who wanted to raise funds the capital seekers, they want to raise capital, how they behave, we would look at by demand and supply analysis. So then the search for profits will drive one party's arbitrage profit opportunities to uh, uh, fall in place uh, in line with the equilibrium concept. So everything drives through profit elements that would be again explained and try to analyze all throughout. Okay, then you see the financial structure, what type of a financial arrangement, institutional, legal, infrastructure framework available in your economics. Okay, so how this being looked at transaction costs and asymmetry. Asymmetry is not symmetry. Symmetry is everybody have equal information. Asymmetry is everyone has a different amount of information. But even if you have same information, everybody would not be able to understand the same thing in the same day. So if I'm a professional in certain area, my understanding is greater in, uh, in that element, but I would not be able to understand the health related aspects. That is a medical professional's job. If it's an engineer, he would understand the construction, civil and other related uh, engineering aspects. So likewise, even the same information available for everybody. Even if you have a central bank annual report, the way that you understand by reading and the way somebody else would understand by reading is different. So asymmetry is the difference in terms of availability of information as well as in terms of uh, how one grasps it. But the role of financial market is to make sure this asymmetry being reduced at least minimum standard of information being provided for parties to the economic activities uh, concern. So the financial market try to reduce the asymmetry because you come across this asymmetry and information related consideration when you start discussing the financial crisis and you will see the, the basic element of uh, financial crisis is the failure of information flow. 
and we would also look at aggregate supply and demand analysis. Uh, um, but this uh, topic and the concept uh, that we would look at in aggregate sense uh, would be very challenging with the times that time available for the pro program. So we might uh, be very briefly touched upon, but not uh, necessarily go into details. So this is how I simply see that the program being looked at. I have already explained uh, in terms of what is the textbook uh, that we are using, how we will be uh, uh, going through uh, 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 the, the program and all details. So this is uh, broadly what you will come across um, in our discussions. As I said, uh, I would not be uh, trying to touched upon complex calculation and things like that, because that's not the purpose of this program. We would broadly look at in terms of uh, the concepts, how it's been interpreted, how that's been used, and understand what's underneath those behaviors. And uh, uh, computation and uh, details into further the money supply, money probabilities, monetary economics. If somebody is so interested, uh, you can take up those uh, uh, for further considerations for your further studies. So this is broadly the elements that we would discuss before we move into the next uh, topic, uh, uh, next uh, chapter of discussion. Uh, any questions or any clarifications that you are interested in? Please, uh, if you have anything, you can raise it. If not, uh, you can uh, put it down to the wall so I can uh, see and uh, follow it up on that basis. Right. So we have uh, looked at broader introduction to the topics that uh, we will come across. And uh, we will start today the topic uh, to discuss uh, the, the financial system. This is very interesting because this set you the background for you to understand uh, 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 what's the financial system, how it operates, and through which uh, you will be able to then coin uh, smaller pieces uh, of this in our future uh, uh, class discussions and things like that. So the financial system, right, uh, very much in terms of financial assets you are looking at. We call it financial markets, where the bond market, stock markets are predominant uh, throughout the world. And financial intermediaries, that is the banks, insurance companies, pension funds, are the all agencies you see in the uh, uh, economy, mainly the financial related agencies. Uh, 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 they have the basic function. The financial uh, system comprises of financial markets and financial intermediaries, and they have the basic function of sourcing resources, right? Sourcing uh, resources from uh, general public uh, uh, by moving those funds from uh, the entities who have surpluses, right? Right? To those uh, entities, they have shortage of funds. So the financial uh, uh, system facilitates this through financial assets from another perspective and financial intermediaries. So the surplus entities in one side, right? And the deficit entities in the other side who has a demand for these assets uh, based on their economic endeavors economic purposes, economic projects that they are going to undertake, but they don't have resources. But from another perspective, there is another component in the economy. They have surplus of funds after consuming for all their requirements, but they don't have an avenue or a project proposal or a project plan of economic activity that they can make use of those. So they channel these assets or finances 
to the parties in the other side where they require. So the financial system facilitates this through the financial assets in financial markets and financial intermediaries who act in the middle and channel these funds from one entity to the other. So this is broadly the financial system that uh, you come across. So if you want uh, examples like uh, when uh, the, the, the companies invents, uh, invent uh, new technologies, uh, IBM is now uh, all the consideration. You see many other aspects of today's uh, smartphones uh, and, and um, now artificial intelligence, all kind of things, um, uh, 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 AIs and things like that. Uh, they have better project proposals uh, and invents uh, new uh, uh, aspects of uh, 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 human behavior and human um, facilitation. They need sometimes the funds, right, to do those uh, projects and uh, get hold of those uh, in a certain scale. I mean, scale the volumes uh, required to be produced and only you have so-called economies of scale being factored in. Don't worry about these words for the time being. You will very clearly understand what these things are as we move on, right? So they have these proposals, brilliant ideas and invest, uh, investment proposals, okay? Uh, same way you probably see the local governments or the central government, the provincial governments, they have many purposes including building a road, building a community hall, school, whatever. Okay. But they require more funds than what they collect as whatever possible ways through taxes and things like that. The government also same. Right. So what matters here is there are proposals, there are uh, requirements in terms of maintaining public goods but they don't have resources. So what matters here is the financial system, well-functioning financial market and financial intermediaries. They have to play a role. They will come and play a role and they will facilitate uh, economic uh, well-being uh, of these uh, uh, economic agents uh, through various modes of uh, 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 operations. Okay, so to study the effects of these financial market and financial intermediaries on the economy, uh, we have to get a kind of a feel on general structure and its operation. That's why I said we will put in place the small pieces into the equation so you will come to know what's the general structure of a financial system that would help you to get a kind of a feel on to how best these uh, financial markets and intermediaries operate, okay? So we will look at major financial intermediaries and the instruments uh, in financial markets as well as uh, how these markets operate and, and to some extent regulated in this section. So that's broadly the preview into the uh, topic that uh, we are trying to uh, understand here. Then you see uh, uh, there is a supplement, uh, uh, a read supplement, uh, reading supplement for you all for this lecture. Uh, I will share that with I, uh, IBSL and they would uh, share with you all probably after the discussion today, or you might get it before the next uh, uh, discussion. So it's a, a, a Word document uh, so you can read through that has number of concepts uh, uh, that you are, we are repeating all throughout in our discussions, you will be able to kind of read and understand some of these uh, 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 concepts that we are uh, elaborating, discussing here. So from a perspective of financial market, it's a broad, broader term, okay? Uh, this describes again a marketplace where buyers and sellers participate in trade of financial assets. Right? So you can't physically say this is the market, uh, that is the market, it's difficult. It's, it's not necessarily right to say a, a physical location, but there are financial centers established. So when you say Wall Street, uh, it's, it's a financial center. It's established. It's a marketplace. 
right? So even to some extent in uh, certain uh, other places, the countries, if not uh, the cities themselves, promote themselves as uh, uh, financial centers. The Singapore, Hong Kong, you see then uh, 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 Dubai, Mauritius. So they are promoting themselves, London, Frankfurt, right? So they promote themselves as financial centers. But you probably come across certain uh, locations within these uh, cities are reasonably concentrated with financial markets and financial intermediaries. So more or less activities of financial centric is greater. But you can't necessarily recognize a physical location, but you can still see all these stock exchanges, commodity exchanges, financial intermediaries are mostly located here. So what's the financial market? It's a marketplace where buyers and sellers uh, 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 participate in trade of financial assets. Okay, but you probably see uh, similar financial assets could trade uh, elsewhere. So you have uh, so-called uh, uh, very basic uh, homegrown systems, even in Sri Lankan society. I'm, I'm not sure whether that is that much prevalent in uh, 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 modern, if not uh, what you are seeing in today's uh, uh, city, city dwellers, if not city lifestyle. Even in uh, uh, certain terms, you know, C2 and things like that, that's happening. Right? So in a way that also the financial products being developed and serviced across different participants. But that different to a financial markets uh, simply by financial markets having transparent uh, pricing arrangements. The prices of financial markets can be derived through supply and demand possibilities. Of course, within supply and demand possibilities, there are influences, but it's a mechanism through which the price is determined. Then you see some regulations on trading. And this is important because if you come across a certain circumstances, somebody bought a financial assets, but then all of a sudden he recognized the financial assets he brought is expensive. When he can uh, default on his transaction. But then the regulations are there in terms of how to settle that type of possibilities, if not fraudulent activities. Then the financial markets also has cost and fees. The operational structures facilitates the certain uh, fee structure based arrangements cost structure based arrangements this has to be i mean these have to be efficient otherwise uh, people would not use financial markets they will try to forego the financial markets and try to get their financial assets being transacted through other modes for instance uh, you come across now uh, fund transfers migrant employees transferring funds through formal banking, if not financial intermediary channel bosses, they are using uh, various other undial, hawala, people call these things. Why? Probably the cost elements in formal trans transfer of funds may be a reason for them to kind of look into that alternate possibilities of uh, transferring. And then the other thing is, uh, uh, they probably not uh, financially literate. They don't want to go through uh, formal channels where they are uh, worried about they being monitored, they being uh, 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 come under the purview of tax authorities, all kind of considerations. But whether they have a fallback in the event of a, a, a default, if not those are trust-based, understanding-based transactions. Okay. 
So the financial markets are characterized by so for pricing, regulations, uh, cost and fee structures, then the market forces, and then of course infrastructure, I have not uh, mentioned here, but you have to have some infrastructure in financial markets in terms of uh, at least trading um, desks and screens for certain type of asset classes, right? And, uh, and these prices being uh, determined through forces of supply and demand in the market. So this is the kind of approach that you see into the financial systems that we are trying to understand. And you will get the read supplement. So read through, uh, uh, try to understand. Uh, that would be very helpful uh, before you try to uh, 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 further elaborate uh, in our next discussions and so on. Right, any questions up to now? Sir. Yes. Right. So if you uh, uh, have anything, as I was uh, repeatedly mentioning, you can uh, drop down a message also. So we will uh, uh, go on and try to kind of understand here what is the functions of financial markets. The essential function, or from a Another perspective, you can say the conventional essential function, if not conventional function of financial markets are channeling funds from economic players that have saved surpluses to those that have a shortage of funds. This is basically the function of deposit taking and then loaning. You channel funds from uh, economic agents, they have surpluses. When you channel them to the parties in the economy, they have demand for capital, demand for funds, not necessarily capital, sometimes even consumption. Right? So sometimes people say, you borrow, you uh, uh, finance through uh, uh, market arrangements for uh, weddings. Weddings, uh, some some explains as uh, 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 what is this? Uh, not a capital investment. It's a current investment, consumption, but it's not necessarily the same. It has elements of capital components, right? So similarly, you borrow funds to buy a vehicle. For personal usage, you may have, uh, and also for some uh, economic activities, then it changes. And you borrow to build a house, buy financial assets. But similarly, the big projects, as I was explaining about, uh, Apple, IBM, and things like that um, in our previous slides. So you have brilliant uh, inventions. You require resources. So the financial markets perform the basic functions of channeling surpluses to deficit entities. So deposit taking and loaning is the conventional functions of uh, financial markets and effectively the conventional functions of financial intermediaries. But very interesting concept here is the financial markets perform the direct finance function. There is a concept called direct finance versus indirect finance. Direct finance is the borrowers borrow funds directly from lenders. You borrow as a borrower directly from the lender by passing financial intermediation, by issuing securities. The stocks that we issue, the company who wants to uh, finance 
the resources channel these funds directly from uh, uh, the parties who have surpluses. So what you are basically seeing here is uh, 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 the the conventional functions being performed, but interestingly, uh, financial intermediaries exist even in direct finance because you can't issue uh, 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 stocks directly to a uh, investor investor would not necessarily know all the details of the company who is going to uh, buy shares he would know the prospectors and then the market infrastructure all kind of things but effectively somebody is facilitating stock brokers stock uh, promoters financial uh, investment banks all they are they are promoting all these things right but effectively they are the relationship that you build through directly financing the companies if not the project proposal uh, 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 that requires funding directly from parties who are investing so the relationship there is you build a more or less a ownership kind of a relationship so direct finance you think uh, you can raise it's very challenging because of various reasons we will come to that but all these equity stocks and bonds and things like that being built is mainly through direct financing you invest directly with the borrower right so that's a direct finance then you will see the functions of financial markets I didn't touch upon indirect finance here. You will come to that point as we move on. So then you can easily segregate what is direct and what is indirect. But uh, direct is no, now aware to most of you all based on uh, what we discussed uh, and what the other function of financial market is. They promote economic efficiency. How? by producing efficient allocation of capital. So when it comes to a, a financial market, okay, so they don't look at uh, whether party A wants money, party B wants money, party C wants money, and party X want to invest, party Y want to in invest, invest, party z want to invest no fine all a to z can invest all a to z can uh, 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 fund their funding requirements the priority in terms of uh, allocation is how capable the the a to z in terms of their project proposals how reliable the the proposal a to z in terms of uh, meeting or honoring obligation envisage timely payment of interest timely payment of capital and how effective the project proposals that they have put forward whether it is a, a, a solution if it skews a, a, a very productive uh, uh, production capabilities and also the profit opportunities it's it's very much of a uh, efficient uh, transmission of uh, uh, resources from surplus entity to deficit entities not by looking at the face not by looking at the color not by looking at other uh, uh, elements that are not necessarily economically efficient but unfortunately there are allocation of resources through various arrangements, um, even in countries like uh, US or for that matter, OECD countries, uh, even in countries like Sri Lanka, that happens. 
but that is not necessarily efficient allocation probably an efficient proposals being kept aside and uh, 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 somebody being favored so that's a different uh, structure but certain times uh, are there in the economies where even you don't have any proposals even though you have resources if not the proposals available are highly risky so the financial intermediaries financial markets would not try to uh, uh, promote such given uh, unbearable risk possibilities so through which they try to kind of a uh, preserve capital from another perspective for uh, a future productive usages but effectively what financial markets try to promote here is economic efficiency by efficient allocation of capital for uh, uh, very productive usages okay so then another function of financial market is it helps you to purchase time purchases better what is this now you all are here you all are about to start uh, or some have just started if not you have uh, continuing to uh, uh, promote your capabilities by further strengthening your knowledge in terms of uh, financial markets and also uh, other required disciplines for better opportunities in the future right so what happened here is uh, from the very first day of employment you probably would like to have a motor vehicle right certain type of uh, 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 equipments i mean it's not uh, unusual for a uh, 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 any career uh, starter to have a, a, a tab or a laptop or a mobile in today's context and it's very common but interestingly you would like to see uh, a, a much more advanced versions and uh, these things being uh, used by you and similarly you would like to see uh, uh, you build a house uh, uh, of your own you get married and you have a motor vehicle you travel around the world all that is there but if you try to earn through your employment or for that matter your capabilities or through your production possibilities by saving resources from now to another 25 years by the time you build a house you are physically not capable of uh, climbing the stairs you are weak you may not in a position to travel across the world because some seasonal conditions seasonal climatic conditions would not ideal for various possibilities not for all for some you will not be able to drive a motor vehicle the way that you want because your eyesight is weak even if you have uh, nicely uh, uh, tiled if not you have uh, uh, the wooden floors whatever you will not be able to walk efficiently you will slip and fall so what you basically doing through financial markets is financial markets give you the resources required to have those now itself been established but you service across your lifetime earning or future earnings so that the financial products that the financial markets produce you is to make sure your well-being being looked after so you purchase your future time through financial markets and the financial markets allow you to have well-being by allowing you to purchase your time better so you basically kind of you know how some of these uh, assets been built enjoyed 
Of course, some would uh, not necessarily require because they probably have their uh, uh, parental and heritage, whatever, that they are continuing. But even if they have it, still you prefer to have your own. So you can build your career, you can have your wealth being used, fine. But still, if you wanted to have something, the financial markets have opportunities being provided. So that's also another very important, significant function of the financial markets. We talked about direct finance. Right? So the savers channel their resources to borrowers. You can see in this chart, the bottom part of this chart is uh, direct finance. So all the parties, or so for that matter, surplus entities, or from another perspective, lenders include households, business firms, government, foreign uh, uh, parties. Same parties would be, again, the borrowers or the spenders. Some households have uh, surpluses, some households have deficits. Some business firms have surpluses, some business firms require funds. So direct finance, they basically meet each other by issuing securities, financial assets. They invest, invest directly. But what is indirect finance is, you don't know where your funds are. You basically transfer your excess funds or surplus uh, 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 assets to a financial intermediary. Financial intermediary is the one who lends or provides capital for another economic agent in the economy. So the channeling of funds take place in indirect finance through the financial intermediaries. You don't know my one million I invested is with company ABC. Your contractual obligation is with the financial intermediary, not with the final ultimate uh, borrower. You don't know where my funds are. But if you go through the direct finance, you know where my stocks are, where I have invested, whose bonds I hold. You have a direct contract with the provider. Financial markets have provided you with the facilitation. But indirect finance, the channeling of funds take shape through a financial intermediaries. Your contractual obligation is with the financial intermediaries. The financial intermediaries, either they lend to uh, ultimate uh, capital requires or the fund requires the borrowers, or they themselves again come to financial market and invest, like you directly invest with uh, uh, a borrower or a capital seeker. So then the financial intermediary become uh, uh, directly invested in that uh, uh, entity. So you see this complex structure, the flow of funds in the financial system happens through either direct or indirect finance structures. In the direct finance, you often have your contractual obligations with the final uh, 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 capital seeker, where your surpluses being invested there, and your contractual obligation often rests with the uh, uh, final, final uh, uh, capital seeker. Whereas in the indirect finance, you channel your resources through a financial intermediation in the financial market and you obligate sorry the your contractual arrangement is with the financial intermediary and the financial intermediary has a contractual obligation with the final final user so you are not aware where my amounts are being invested if you are the only one then of course you know where it is but financial intermediaries has millions of similar uh, 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 economic agents engaging with them. The funds are channeled to a, a pool of funds. From there, that fund lot, they've been 
funded for different purposes. So understand what is direct, what is indirect. So the any financial modality that you talk in financial markets fall either into direct or to the indirect. Any question before I move and discuss about the structure of financial markets? Right. Because this uh, indirect uh, and uh, direct uh, structures that you come across is uh, a, a very very important and very interesting because uh, you find uh, the globally these financial structures play a very important role in defining uh, uh, to some extent the the level of efficiency in allocating financial resources so we will get into some empirical details numbers and and composition of uh, uh, share between direct and indirect in overall financial system so then you can get a kind of a feel but interestingly when we talk about uh, financial structures in the financial markets uh, you find uh, markets financial markets mainly the stock and bond markets where debt and equities are traded the bond markets debt instruments are traded in the stock market equity okay equity is indirectly uh, 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 the the same words people use for stocks okay uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, debt instruments uh, you have a duration you have a maturity period you contractually agree to lend for a five-year period so at the maturity that the five year end of five year you will be receiving your investment that's a basic uh, conceptual structure of a debt contract when it comes to equities there is no defined lifeline. You are investing in a company. That company can bust tomorrow or that can last for 100 years or perpetuality. We don't know. What you gain for your investment is dividends. Whatever the earnings of the company, you will have a right on that earning so you get dividends periodically they di distribute dividends from their earnings they distribute a certain share of that earnings to the uh, uh, owners equity equity holders are owners of that company but there are some differences in terms of what type of a stock that you hold but then uh, generally the equity owners are the owners equity holders are the owners so the structure in terms of debt and equity markets are mainly differentiate in terms of duration or the maturity you see in debt markets and uh, the the dividends are the payment structure of equities market then you see primary and secondary market Okay, so in the primary market, we will come to greater details uh, when it comes to bond markets uh, that uh, define more clarity in terms of what is the primary and secondary markets. But when it comes to primary and secondary markets in financial market, the underwriters exist when it comes to primary markets. You underwrite in the event of in the event of non-subscription of the full issuance somebody agrees to buy not 
the full amount, let's say 25%. So you they will charge you underwriting fees. So if you promote well, yes, you can get full subscription. So you can allocate the full amount uh, in the primary market. But when it comes to bond markets, you find the issuer, issuer exist in the primary market. You are buying directly from the issuer and through creation of new financial assets. So in the primary market, you actually create you give birth to new financial assets. Even if it is a already issued a bond that has been reopened and issued, but still you are expanding the volume. So it's again, you are giving birth to new financial assets. So in the primary market, apart from underwriting exists, you see a issuer exists from another perspective or issuer's agent exists. He is the one who is issuing, for instance, government of Sri Lanka issues government securities. Central bank issues on behalf of government of Sri Lanka. So you are buying government of Sri Lanka's bills and bonds. All those central bank issues, it's not central banks bills or bonds. Right. So in the primary market, apart from that, as I said, you basically create new financial assets, new financial instruments. And in the secondary market, you don't see underwriting, but you see brokers and dealers. And they do trades of already issued securities between investors. Even here, the issuer would be there, then he become an investor there. He's not playing a role of an issuer. Because in the secondary market, sometimes the issuers buy securities through which effectively they are trying to do a buyback kind of, but it's not a formal buyback because if you want to have a formal buyback uh, of financial assets you have already issued, you have to follow a established regulated process it is you are a, a kind of you know make use of opportunities available either through price or other expectations to make a purchase from the secondary market so you are not creating any new assets here you are basically trading existing assets okay so this is what i was uh, 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 explaining in the prima, primary market, stocks are created, debt instruments are first issued. So I was basically saying uh, you are giving birth, right? So you see uh, a, a primary market uh, from that perspective. And the secondary market, they basically trade already issued stocks or debt instruments. So the major exchanges stock exchanges bond exchanges they perform this function any questions up to now it's okay sir Do you have a question or? No. no okay. Sense. Okay. Thank you. Right. So you see the structure that we are looking at in financial markets, the primary market, secondary market. And similarly, you see the exchanges. These are formal arrangements or the infrastructure established to exchange financial assets
So you see the stocks and bonds are often brought, bought and sold in uh, these exchanges. These are very much established. But then, of course, uh, you have another concept called OTC, over the counter. We will talk about that. Apart from exchanges, these stocks and bonds are brought and sold uh, in the exchanges. The famous uh, exchanges are the New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. Then you see Columbus Stock Exchange. You are very familiar with that. National Stock Exchange and Bombay, Bombay Stock Exchange in India. And the exchanges where you see bond and uh, uh, stock exchanges are often um, in, in, in the same place in Singapore, London and Frankfurt. These are global financial centers. So you see uh, uh, these exchanges often contributes and helps the buyers and sellers to exchange their financial assets. And, and, and these are often traded uh, in terms of both primary market issuances as well as secondary market uh, issuances. Secondary market is often the, the general norm. Primary market, where required, where issuances happens, being kind of traded through exchanges uh, in most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. Even the secondary market trades, happens uh, most of the time through exchanges, but not all of the time. There may be circumstances it could happen outside the exchanges. That's what I said, over-the-counter markets, OTC. Why over-the-counter? That you are basically not going through the established price screens, price, uh, 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 you can see the buyers, you can see the sellers, but you know those stuff that's uh, you keep aside, but you are directly trying to negotiate the transactions due to various reasons. Let's say you are going to the Sunday market. You are a producer. You have a huge quantity of, let's say, mangoes to sell. Right? So if you take all the mangoes to the market and try to sell it there, what happened to the price? Immediately, because you have brought a lot of mangoes to sell, that means uh, supply, higher supply, prices would reduce. Okay. Similarly, you are a buyer. You want to buy a big quantity of uh, mangoes from the market. Now you don't have that big supply, a normal market. Huh? So what you do is, you wanted to go to the market and then you demand from everybody. So substantially high demand. What happened to the prices? The prices would increase. Market was 100 because you have now come and demanding a lot. Prices have gone up to 125, 150. It is basic economics. When you have higher, more supply, prices reduces. When you have higher, more demand, prices increases. So from both sides, when the prices reduces, the producer or the supplier get penalized. When prices increases, the buyer or demander get penalized. So to overcome this, you have OTC. There are other reasons also. Sometimes the buyer or the seller don't want to reveal who is buying. Because there are, there are credibility concerns. High net worth individuals participating in markets. 
that carries a huge news effect, news influence across the entire market. For instance, in Sri Lanka, if somebody of high repute and a credible investor comes and buy a huge uh, uh, a stake of a particular company that carries a huge uh, messaging influence. So they are mindful of these possibilities. So what they do is to avoid those volatilities in financial assets, you negotiate sometimes not directly through financial intermediaries because sellers also don't want to negotiate directly with the buyer. So he communicate to broker or the financial intermediary investment bank. I have a million stocks of this company. I wanted to sell. My price at any moment should not be just 1% away from market, prevailing market. If it is tomorrow, tomorrow's price is, let's say, 100 rupees, 1% away is I'm not looking at anything less than 99. So you give some conditionalities also. Or you can say prevailing market. If 100, I want at 100. So buyer would not necessarily say the same. Buyers are there. Buyers would come and say to the financial intermediary, if you have a big parcel of transaction, tell me, I will buy. Similarly, in the bond markets, there are big participants. If somebody knows a big institutional investor is buying, immediately prices increase. If big institutional investor is selling, the prices decrease. Because his transaction volume is often big. Apart from that, there are many other reasons. Those drives these OTC markets also to exist. And mainly in uh, 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 coal money, uh, sorry, the short-term money markets, the federal funds. Or oh, Sri Lanka, it is uh, the coal money market. The coal money market is nothing but short term fund markets between the financial intermediaries, mainly the licensed commercial banks. They transact without any collateral. Underlying assets be not pledged, but they have credit limits. So within that, they trade. So these are open, not screen based but OTC, the foreign exchange market, that also more or less exchange rate. You don't see a screen there, the exchange rate is determined. Uh, it is over the counter. But going forward, foreign exchange would come into a screen-based uh, structure in Sri Lanka also, including the bond market, where we don't have a fully-fledged screen-based trading. We have a limited screen-based trading in Sri Lanka now. In future, you will see that this is changing. So the structure has exchanges and OTC. And then you see segregation of the structure in terms of money and capital markets. That's based on the duration of the transactions that you enter. In. Money markets, they deal with the shorter duration. Open, uh, it's assumed to be sometimes overnight, only one day. Today, tomorrow, if not intraday, within the day itself, the morning you borrow, in the afternoon you settle. Interday, between days, intraday, within the days, within the day itself. So you see money markets are short, but generally segregation comes in when it comes to uh, uh, money, financial assets of uh, less than one year being transacted. It is a money market transaction. Anything beyond one year is the capital market transactions. Right, so the capital market often deal with longer term debt and equity instruments. Money market is short term debt instruments. Right, 
So you see here some uh, segregation. in terms of uh, the features, if not uh, aspects that the money market and the capital market, you can easily kind of uh, segregate and see. As I said, when it comes to duration, money markets are short term, whereas capital markets are for long term fund transactions. And the money market nature of funds being exchanged here, or financial assets being exchanged here, often for working capital, day-to-day -day financing requirements, operational requirements. But when it comes to capital markets, these are for long-term fixed capital requirements. When it comes to instruments, often in financial markets, it's the treasury bills, CPs, commercial papers, CDs, certificate of deposits, or mere financial pledges that's transacting financial market, sorry, the money market. Whereas the bonds, shares, the ventures, trading capital markets, these are long term financial instruments. And the amounts of uh, financial transactions or the instruments being exchanged in money market are often in big volumes. Because participants are anyway major institutional parties, if not high net worth individuals. They know the money market and they don't want to come to the market for a peanut transactions. They wanted the big volume, high value transactions. Whereas in capital market, even a small investor, he wants just a one instrument being exchanged for a smaller quantity, smaller volume. But even in capital market, the huge volumes of transactions by big institutional investors often take shape. In money market, what are the institutions? In capital market, what are the institutions? You see, mainly the segregation here, the pension funds, uh, mortgage funds, uh, societies, they are playing a big role in capital markets where the, the commercial banks, uh, the brokers, even the central bank would play a role in money markets because they just wanted to help out liquidity conditions in the market. Then the risks, because of the duration, the risk is reasonably low in money market transactions. And the probability of default is also less because you transact with established parties and, and duration is long means anything could happen. You can see tomorrow is to some extent certain than one month from now, one year from now, 10 years from now, you don't know what would happen to you in 10 years from now. Even tomorrow or in the afternoon, it, it could happen. But reasonably, you will be a little certain of what's going to happen in uh, uh, one day from now than 10 years from now. So the risk elements uh, in terms of duration is less in money markets compared to capital markets. Any questions? We have a few more elements to be discussed in this section. Uh, that's basically, I prefer to stop at this point uh, uh, and start from there and with the new lesson next week. So if you have any question, you can raise it now. If not, uh, uh, we can... Uh, uh, conclude the discussion uh, today and uh, we will start uh, our discussion next week. Uh, thank you and stay safe. If you have any question, you can uh, put it down even in the wall. Thank you.